comfortable. As a young girl, we're just. Yet the world tries to define us from birth by color, by toy, by actions. It's not that simple. There are so many faces to being a woman, to being a girl, but categories have always just seemed to be one with no variation, judged by exterior. Going outside those lines, you become alternative to the quote unquote norms. They stamp you tomboy. Tom, boy, neither Tom or boy, never who I am. Me, see, I, I play hard. The captain of my own ship. See, I could be anything I want to be. Strong, sweet, mean, attitude. The sky is the limit. From the rising of the sun to the sunset. I am who I am. Me. I am who I am. Me. That was a piece by an artist named Leslie Foster in Los Angeles, a very good friend of mine, for a series he did that were 59 seconds each. He did one a month for a year. But I am who I am, me. So I would love, let's see, do we have, all right, we've got everybody ready. I would love to welcome to the stage Will Murray, and he's going to talk about breakthroughs in leadership with his team. Please welcome Will Murray. Well, thank you all. We're going to have a panel discussion. And... Um, I have to start with a personal note. I cut myself shaving about once a year. And I just did before lunch, so if I start like anyway, that's what this is about. So um, I've had the the pleasure of being able to get pre acquainted um, with Kelly Becker and Jane Zhao at uh, over the last week. And they're two remarkable um, their, their titles are Vice President. Jane uh, is, is Vice President at Dell EMC and Kelly at Schneider Electric. But they're really, their titles are really Astonishing Vice President, Amazing Vice President, Super Vice President, Unusual Vice President. So the reason that we're going to do this is um, really for you. And I'm going to ask some questions about uh, their career and pivot points, turning points, and decisions that they made and, and how they look at their, their life and their work and so on. But I want you to be thinking, we're going to have a conversation here for maybe 30 minutes, and then I want you to be thinking about what, what question you would ask them, because this is called instant mentoring. And uh, I want to make sure your questions get answered, so then we'll, we'll spend some time answering your questions. So I'm going to start off with uh, Jane and... Um, I found out that Jane uh, grew up in Shanghai and then was super attracted to Kansas State University. Uh, and of all the places she could have gone in the world, that's where she went. So, um, Jane, I want, 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 want to tell everybody about your, just your journey from how you approached school when you were younger and then what motivated you to to leave China and go to the strange place of Kansas? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> you know, just a few minutes ago, and the first time I met uh, Will, and he started asking these questions, I saw what interview already started. And he said, well, this is just a warm up. I said, well, great. <laughs> That's good. So anyway, I'm Jane Zhu. I'm a uh, vice president of engineering uh, for the data protection group in Dell EMC and also general manager for the endpoint uh, data protection business unit. Um, as, uh, as Will mentioned that I grew up in China, in Shanghai, and um, I got my master's degree and a bachelor's degree in computer science and computer engineering. The reason I came to the uh, US because I saw there's one professor who actually published uh, eight books in the fuzzy logic, in the decision-making area. That's the, uh, the field I was really, really interested in at that point. So I wrote a letter to the professor, and then after a few uh, letter exchange, not email, just letter, okay? Um, <laughs> and he said, why don't you come over here as a visiting scholar? 
And uh, after six months, uh, he uh, converted me to the PhD uh, uh, program. So I feel very fortunate and uh, come over here to get my degree. And then I joined uh, after the graduation, uh, graduate from K-State. K-State is a, a little Manhattan or a little Apple town, right? Um, I joined uh, Spring Telecommunication as uh, uh, the design engineer or software engineer, and uh, it went through several kind of like uh, the, the the companies and get to where I I I am now. There's no, I did not know uh, I wanted to be VP at that point. Right, that's just uh, a fact. Uh, it's just uh, opportunity comes, and then you're always ready to uh, take on new responsibility and uh, make a difference. Thank you, Jane. So Kelly, um, same question. You, you said that uh, you had a reputation from the time you were a child of a, of a driven person. <laughs> and uh, when did you decide that you really wanted to, well, first of all, tell us about your career. Tell us what you're doing now. And then tell us a little bit about the journey from that, let's say, college to where you are. Sure, so uh, nice to meet everybody. I'm Kelly Becker. I work for Schneider Electric, which is the global leader in energy efficiency and automation. Um, so you might know a lot of our product families, but you might not know Schneider. Um, so I've been in my current role about three years. So I have global P&L responsibility for about $150 million PL, or sorry, country P&L responsibility. Um, 300 people or so on the team. Uh, everybody on the team that works for me today is more technical than I am because uh, my background is really uh, public relations, advertising, uh, right, in college, and then um, a sales background. So it's been a bit of a, a journey over time to move from sales into moving to get my MBA, uh, which I made the decision to do because I wanted to be much more of the com in part of the conversation. Uh, get the opportunity to be a leader, and it often can be a challenge to transition from sales into leading a business. I, I want to ask you right about that pivot point. So uh, you, you spent a lot of time in studying, I guess, PR and advertising and so forth. And then what was it that caused you to go from a, and I would say that's a fairly typical female career, what was it that made you get the MBA, but specifically to want to go into the profit and loss side of the business? Um, a couple of things. Money mattered. Money, for sure. Um, but more importantly, I really felt like I could be part of the conversation. Um, when you're an individual contributor in sales, it's like running your own business. And, and I was a good salesperson. I loved sales. I loved customers. I loved fulfilling their needs. Um, but I saw plenty of people around me um, at the company at the time, who I felt I was just as capable as, as them, but I needed to go get that MBA because it was, for me, a credential um, that gives you a different level of legitimacy sometimes in large corporations. And so that was really the decision point for me. Um, and then I, after I graduated, I went and I decided to stay on more of the industrial side. I tried, um, my summer internship in business school was at Johnson & Johnson, an amazing, amazing company. Uh, but, but I realized consumer marketing wasn't for me, right? I was trying to push lotion, and that just didn't really work for me. Uh, and so I went back to the B&B side and more of an industrial side. Um, and ultimately, um, part of it's luck, I think, but also, um, also I got experience running a p and right out of business school, um, and I was good at it. And I enjoyed it, and I loved that every day is different. Um, I didn't have to be the expert in everything we were doing. Like I said, I'm trying to manage a bunch of engineers, and I'm not an engineer, right? So you get good um, at the things that you're not as good at, which is I'm excellent at asking engineers questions. I'd probably make Jane crazy if we were trying to do a project together about the level of questions that I would ask her to make decisions. But um, I thought I could do it, and so I was determined to um, get to that point and run a panel. Okay, what you just said is really insightful. There's a lot of gold in what you just said in terms of career. And uh, I just want everybody to understand the depth of that because the 
It's, it's one thing, thing I, I, I know many women, women who go out and get MBAs, and they still don't use them in the way that you have. So th this idea that uh, Kelly had that she wanted, she wanted really to be a decision maker. That's really what p &L enables you to do. And lead in a way that isn't just influential, but when you lead what, what she's doing, you get to make those big decisions. You're the one who's listening to other people's opinions. You're not just giving those opinions. And um, I think in my observation in coaching, the clarity of what is fulfilling to you, what Kelly decided, what would really be filling, fulfilling to me is to lead in this way, led to a whole bunch of opportunities and a whole bunch of decisions. So I just want to bring that out. So, so Jane, I've got the same question for you. Every career has pivot points. Um, opportunities taken, opportunities that you said no to. What, what has been the guiding voice in your head about your career? And I would say that, uh, <clears throat> and trust your own instinct and believe in yourself. And I started uh, the management level is by coincidence. And all my, uh, my manager at that point decided to move on. And he pulled me aside, asked me if I'm interested in, uh, you know, move to the management ladder. And at that point, I was the architect in a small company. And uh, I said, well, give me a couple of days to think about it. And the reason, and then, and then I, I went back to him because I thought about it. I said, well, I have done a lot on the coding design. And I would love to share my practice and with the, the younger um, engineer, junior engineer, to help them to grow. So with that in mind, I said, OK, I will you know, take that. And after that, I just uh, I feel like uh, as long as you work very hard and in a small like 60 or you know, 50, 60 uh, people organization, people know you well. So it's very easy for you to get like, promoted to the next level, right? But what I found out that uh, you know, it's true to the, uh, in a small uh, company. But if you get to the big company, and you need to let uh, uh, those who will influence your kind of like career decision know what you are capable of, right? And I just want to share a story, my personal story with you guys. Um, in one company, and uh, I, one of my colleagues who's male, men, and then one time, they, they, one of my managers also decided to move on, and it's a VP uh, position. And uh, without even asking you know, me whether I'm interested in that, and then uh, people thought uh, you know, that uh, my peer, uh, he is very interested in VP position. So they naturally gave that position to him without even get, uh, uh, give me opportunity to apply for that position, right? So after this happened, I asked uh, my manager at that point, I said, well, what is the reason? Is that because this promotion is based on the performance? Or based, is it what criteria they use to uh, promote the person? And then the, the, the answer I got, it was that, oh, we thought you were so happy with what you do. I said, so, yes, I'm happy with what I do. That does not mean that uh, I'm not interested in the promotion, right? So when my uh, future boss know about uh, my interest, and then six months later, there's opportunity to come up from another group as a VP position. So they, they thought about me, and then you know, goes, went through the several interview cycle, and I got, uh, uh, fortunately enough, got that position. So it's not like a planned. In a small company, definitely, it's important to, you, know, you know, you work hard and other people will notif notice you and then actually will think about you if there's any opportunity. But for the big company, in the big company, you need to let others know you are very capable of doing the things, you know, the other uh, uh, male colleague does, right? And uh, express, make sure that your interests are also known by others. I really love that story, Jane, because it is emblematic of um, the, the life of a professional woman. You know? uh, I, I, I do a, a lot of interviewing and focus group work, and 
but both men and women, about bias. And one of the things that many men uh, unconsciously believe that all you women have really busy lives and have multiple interests, and you're, you're not as driven about work as men are because you're more secure, right? And so they sometimes think they're doing you a favor by not asking if you like a more uh, demanding job, or even a more demanding assignment. And, uh, and they're assuming that, you know, this is for your own good kind of thing. It's left over from a lot of patriarchal, baby boomer thinking. Anyway, so what, what Jane did, uh, which was not get mad, but, you know, assert herself in a, in a non-threatening but very clear way, uh, if, if any, if there was one piece of advice I would give to all of you, um, especially if you have a boss that looks anywhere similar to somebody like me, <laughs> tell the me's of the world what you want. Be really clear, because we cannot read your minds. <laughs> Kelly, did you have, have you had some similar experiences? Yeah, I think it's, um, it, it's pretty normal. I think for women um, throughout their careers to, to run into contact with people who aren't clear of what you want. I'm fairly vocal. That's not surprising probably, but, um, and I've been very vocal my entire career about what I want. And I think I've also been um, very willing to take risks and to take on the role that didn't seem great. Um, so three years ago, I used to be in uh, the Our North American Strategy Team, which was an amazing experience, but I was ready to get back into an operational role. And uh, the gentleman I was working for at the time said, uh, well, God, you know, we've got these, all these huge businesses, right? They're billion-dollar businesses. I can't put you into something like that. But I have this really crappy business, and it's a series of turnarounds, and the businesses need to be fixed, and we need some new leadership, and we need some new energy, and some new thoughts, and new strategies, but it's pretty crappy. So, are you interested? And, um, and, you, and you look at that, and you go, and I, I did, I kind of sat on it, I talked to some different sponsors I have in the company, and I ultimately took it. Because for me, a lot of the roles I've taken over the last many years are because I could make a difference. I could fix it. I could change it. Um, I could show people how great the team was that I was inheriting, despite sort of whatever perception might have been out there in a big company. Um, and it was it is the best job I could have taken. I have met tremendous people in the company. My network has grown a lot because I'm dealing with a lot of different groups. And we turn the business around, right? And when you get leaders under you, so I have a leadership team now today that believes just as strongly as I do that these businesses are great and they're growth opportunities and they're exciting for Schneider. Um, and we are turning them around and we're moving them in the right direction and we're recruiting other top talent in the company into our group because we're passionate about what we're trying to do. So don't let somebody um, scare you. I think sometimes it's a test. To, right? How committed are you, Kelly, to wanting to run a p and I'm going to give you the worst one I can find. And, and if you're serious about it, you'll take it, right? And I, so I do think don't um, look at those as real opportunities, because for me, I, I probably would have had to wait a lot longer to get um, an opportunity back running a p and and I got it because I, I took a shot, right? Um, and it really had nowhere to go but up. Um, and it's been a tremendous experience, and I've learned so much about people management and building cultures um, over the last couple of years that I, when I took the job, I, I never had any idea of what I would actually really learn. Well, what, what Kelly has just described, you may know as the glass cliff, which means that in many large companies, when things go bad in a division or a group, they look for a, a woman to bail it out, and, and uh, the research says the pernicious reason they do is that if they fail, um, they can blame it on a woman. Uh, and so, you know, when GM goes down, they get Mary Vera. When Yahoo gets into trouble, they give it to Marissa Meyer. Now, there are two different stories there, but um, the, I'll just make this comment, is that, uh, you have to really understand what I would call a minimum viable opportunity is. 
So sometimes you may be getting an opportunity to try to resurrect a dead horse, and that horse has been ridden to death. There's no hope. And the two things that will determine whether this is an opportunity like Kelly got are the support of the people that are giving you that opportunity, the resources and the ramp time. How realistic are they? And the second thing is the people that you can bring onto the team. Because you cannot resurrect a dead horse w without a whole team of, of people who are, uh, you don't need an army of them, but you need a few that are just really outstanding. So when you're given an opportunity to do something that's really going to be hard that nobody else wants, just remember those two things. How much support are you going to get? What are the resources you can get? And what are the people you can get? Because you need to set yourself up for success. Otherwise, the blow to your self-esteem and your future career could be. But Kelly's absolutely right. Those are the, the leapfrog opportunities that are especially available to women. So getting your mind right about that can really be a career booster. So Jane. Um, uh, one, one of the things, things that fascinated me about you is you, you said that uh, you're, you're a leader of distributed teams. Uh, I'd just like you to tell everybody where your teams are and, and what it takes for you to do what you do in terms... You said something that was really key about how, how to make distributed teams work. I'd like you to tell the group that. Well, actually, I, I manage um, the organization with probably like more than 800 uh, the people across uh, the globe and I have uh, like 13 different sites. So uh, sometimes I, I told people that I spend most of my time or 60% of time on the road, right? But I find that uh, the important thing is for you to create a, a leadership team that uh, you can trust and you can depend on, right? So I share with Will uh, during lunch time. I said, well, I, I find uh, you know, the strong leader at each side. So they can help you to execute against roadmap. They can help you to reach out to the customer and bring more revenue in, right? So um, on my side is, you know, I, I joined EMC about uh, three and a half years ago. I did not know anything about storage. And I came completely from the software industry, right? But uh, the thing is, I, I approach to the new uh, responsibility is always stay curious and ask uh, the questions for the things you don't know. Don't try to pretend, oh, you're the leader, you're supposed to know everything. Uh, people understand. And uh, no leader is perfect and knows everything, right? So stay curious and uh, build a strong leadership team that uh, you can trust. And then uh, count on the architects. Of course, so I also ask a lot of questions to the architects and why we design this way, not that way, and what is the you know, performance impact, right? All these questions. But ultimately, you want to empower your team uh, so that uh, they can think out of the box as long as they know what is the goal you want them to accomplish. So it is extremely, extremely important. I just want to make another comment on top of what Kelly mentioned. I've been engineering leader for a long, long time. Uh, just a few months ago, I got the opportunity to take over one small business unit as a general manager, and what a difference kind of like experience for the last, over the last uh, few months. I was uh, able to work directly with sales team, with the customer, with the marketing, and to come up with a you know, go-to-market strategy, and also what kind of marketing event we have to uh, uh, have in order to drive the revenue up. So the opportunity will always come, as long as you kind of like, uh, you cannot just uh, you know, plan for your future without focusing what you have, you're supposed to accomplish, right? So my, my uh, the lesson I learned from my past 20 plus years experience as an engineering leader is um, whatever you do, you put your heart and soul in it. Right? That's one. Second one is if the opportunity comes, not, uh, don't be afraid to, not to take it. If you, like, uh, for me, I had no idea about, uh, you know, PNL before, right? But for the last few months, I learned a lot. I contributed a lot. I feel like working with the team, we made a big difference. So um, 
you know, be ready when opportunity comes. That's great. I, you know, I'll just comment on that. The most successful senior women that I've known that uh, become CEOs or started their own significant organizations um, follow exactly what Jane and Kelly have been saying. I, I just put it in, there are three things that I have figured out that seem to work. Uh, first is that they, women have confidence that they can learn anything. The, the, the women who uh, are before you today are those kind of women. Like, I, I'm an engineer, never run a P&L, but they said privately, I think Jane said, or maybe it's Kelly, both, whatever. They said, well, I've been around a lot of leaders and they're not smarter than I am. And I, let me tell you, I've been around a lot of CEOs. They're not smarter. They're really not. There, there's a limit to how smart people are. You know, once you get to being a, being a good student, that's the limit. So you're as smart as almost all the people who are running things anywhere. It's not like they have special powers. They just act smarter. Um, so this whole idea that, that you're bright enough to learn anything is something that I want you to take away because it's a huge confidence builder. You can prove yourself on the job. You don't have to prove yourself before the job. Um, the second thing is uh, the women that I know that have, again, been like Kelly and Jane, have been incredibly brave. And what that means is that they're, they're willing to fail because they have confidence in their resilience and the ability to learn and come back. And if you're bright and brave, you can pretty much do anything. And I think you're both an example of that. So I want to, we're, we're going to go for another, I've got one more round of questions that we're going to open up to you. But, and, and the questions are about life balance. So um, Jane was telling me, she went on a world tour over the last couple of months. Um, not, not the kind of world tour you really want to have, but nevertheless, she's traveled around the world. And, uh, and, and Kelly travels every week almost, I think. And I, I, I just want to hear from you, we'll start with you, Kelly, uh, about what's your strategy to have a life as well as a career? Yeah, I think it's um, the age-old topic, right? Life balance, can you have work-life balance? And for me, it comes in waves quite frankly. Um, so three years ago when I took that business, I did not have balance for probably the first year I was trying to run the business. I was trying to figure out what I was doing, right? And to Will's point, you put on a brave face, right? You get in every quarterly business review or whatever you're doing and you're like, I got it. I know exactly what I'm doing. And deep in the back of your mind, you're like, I have no idea what's going on, right? But it's all about brave face, the story makes sense, you know what you're doing. And in that first year, I had to spend a lot of time recruiting the right people to join the team and, and getting on that. Um, and then last year, I took over another piece of the business that needed some work. Um, and so I didn't maybe get the first half of the year quite as balanced. But now, I've gotten much more into a place where I'm on the road a lot, probably at least 75% of the time. But when I'm home in Chicago, I'm home. I work regular hours. I'm an eight to five person. I'm going to the gym in the morning or at lunch. Um, and I'm shutting down around five when I'm home because I want to have a little bit better respect for my partner and I want to see our friends and I want to go do things. And he appreciates that. And when I'm on the road, I kind of belong to Schneider. And that's the way I look at it, right? I try and get up in the morning and go to the gym. And after that, my day, my day today is probably going to go till 10 o'clock at night with a lot of people. And that's okay. And I'll probably do email till midnight, right? Because I'm making that definition. And for me, I've gotten to a much better place in the last year of really just saying you have to give your brain a break sometimes. And you have to have some level of respect for what's important to you. And those things change and they evolve. But for me... When I'm home, it's um, about having a balance. And it's about making sure the people that are important to me know they're important to me and I'm there and I'm present. Um, and frankly, um, working for a company that weekends are really respected. The company I was at before, weekends were not respected. And um, I think that can wear on you. You have to give yourself a break and know that the, the other portion of your life is just as important. So it's, it's a bit of a... Um, back and forth for me sometimes. It goes in waves, I guess. Jane? Thank you, Kelly. 
Yeah, I I kind of like agree with what Kelly just mentioned that uh, you know you need to give yourself some time. Um, but uh, I also would like to uh, kind of like make a, a one point my experience as well. And when you get to like a certain uh, uh, level, and then you feel like the work is part of your life, not is completely separate, right? And then your life has work and the family and your own personal need. So how to kind of like balance all these things out and take a priority. And these priority changes, right? And for example, if you are in the, um, in the uh, dinner with your family, and at that point, I would never check my phone. I always put my phone away, right? Be present and be, make sure that the other, the people around you can feel that you're, you know, you're really uh, kind of like talking to them instead of like talking to them and looking at them in the eye, but thinking about something else, right? So, um, so that's why second way same applies in the workplace, right? And uh, sometimes you okay, you have uh, kids in school and need to go to volleyball tournament, and uh, but. You, as long as you put in your calendar saying that this time I need to leave so that you don't have to think, constantly think about it during the meeting with your coworkers, right? So my, my experience is work is part of life and it all comes down to how you prioritize, prioritize them so that uh, make sure that whenever you have a meeting and a gathering with your friend or with your coworkers, you're always present. Well, that's the seminar. Right there on life balance. Being present, yeah, I would agree. And boundaries. The, the one thing uh, that I, in my experience in, in helping women with this issue, uh, one of the things that I always tell them is that many companies you're supposed to be, once you reach a certain level, available pretty much 24-7 via email. And what I've, been, what I've advised women, and uh, in these same companies, many of them name brand companies that you know, where they have this hero ethic, um, I just tell them that, um, just tell people you're, you're offline and if something comes up to call you, you have your cell phone with you, but to call you on the phone, like an old fashioned phone call, and nobody ever calls. So it's a trick. It's a way of being available, but telling people you're not going to look at their texts or emails. So, and, and I've helped hundreds of women just get away with murder using this technique. So, I, I just pass it on to you. All right, we'd love to hear questions uh, from you. There's some microphones. Um, and uh, this is a, a chance to ask some very, very successful women leaders uh, what's on your mind. We have some questions? Yes, please. Hi, thank you for the sharing. That's uh, very useful information for us. Uh, so I used to work for the big corporations. Now I'm doing my own startups. So my question to both of you would be, um, have you ever tried to do your own business? And what would you want to try one day? Um, I have not, minus, uh, I think, teaching swim lessons and running my own swim lesson business in high school and college. Um, but I think the bravest people are people who um, go after startups, right? I'm, I'm guaranteed pretty close a paycheck every two weeks, um, whereas, you know, you may not be, right? And eventually, um, I, I think working for a startup or a smaller company one day would be amazing. Uh, I haven't gone that path because I feel like I'm still very much learning um, in big corporations and I continue to get um, great opportunities. I also think to, to go down the startup path, you've got to have a great idea, and I haven't had a great idea. So maybe once that comes to me. Um, I, I never had my own company, but I work for both a uh, big company and a startup company. And both startup company got acquired by the big company. Um, so my experience is that in a startup company, it's kind of like uh, the, uh, the area you actually have to wear multiple hats uh, in order to get things done, right? And you will learn a lot from have your startup company by yourself or join a startup company. Because uh, um, I, when I work for a security company, it's a startup company, I had to wear uh, the engineering ha uh, hat and the support 
and IT and product management as well. So that will give you the exposure to the different area and the talking to the customer, right? And a big company, and uh, it's a little bit different. And uh, some company have a lot of process in place, and then uh, you will, you know, sometimes you got frustrated. And these things could be just done within five minutes, and why take like uh, one month and it's still pending, right? It has a different, uh, you know, pros and cons. It comes down to your priority. If you enjoy to work on the things that you're passionate about, and also you want to have a total control, go with startup. <laughs> but if you want to have a steady income, and you want to uh, uh, leverage the well-established process in the big company, and then that's the big companies, uh, you know, will provide this kind of benefit for you. Great. Yes. Hi. So I just wanted to follow up. Thank you, first of all, for all those insights. I have a question about feminine leadership. So um, number one question I think for a lot of us, we want to know, how do we develop executive presence but not have to copy men too much or feel the pressure that... We are, we have to be just like a man. So that's my question. I, I work in a male, male, male dominated world. Um, and there are pros and cons to that. The pro is every time I sit at my boss's staff, I get to talk if I want to talk, right? Because I'm considered a different, a different opinion. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, at the same time, I think, Women often, I certainly um, think about this, period, have to um, battle the idea that you're not a bee, right? You're not so aggressive that um, you just make people uncomfortable. And, and I kind of go both ways on it. Some days I choose to be super aggressive because I'm trying to make a point or I'm trying to get something done or accomplished. And other days I'm happy to be a lot calmer and, and work within the realm um, you know, of what I'm trying to accomplish. And I think, so I guess I don't really think about it in the way you phrase the question. I just think about there's a time and place for different um, mentalities and different ways in which you choose to act. Just make sure it's a choice. Um, and when it's not a choice anymore, then sometimes you need to step back and evaluate what else is going on for you. But for me, um, I often make the choice to be um, very aggressive in situations where I feel like I need to be heard um, or that I'm just, I can't handle the taking, you know, something that should take five minutes and it takes a month, right? Uh, my experience, at least, is that women have a lot less tolerance for the delays when a decision's been made, right? If a decision is made, then I expect you to move. And um, there, this isn't up for debate. You know, I tell people on my team all the time, we do not live in a democracy, right? It's not a democracy. Um, and that's okay, just know where you fit into that whole picture, so. Um, I would advise you kind of like a copy how men do things, right? We have our own strength. And uh, I think we have, uh, you know, male colleagues here uh, as well. I'm not trying to put them in a hot spot. But women definitely have a unique benefit and we have to juggle ball, multiple balls at the same time, right? And we tend to be able to, you know, better handle our multitask. That's the one. Second one is, you know, you know, you don't put yourself as a kind of like a woman. You are equal, you know, with your coworkers, right? This mindset is extremely important. And so that when you kind of voice your opinion and make your decision, and that should reflect that. Right. And third one is, I do want to mention that some uh, male colleagues, they do, sometimes they handle things kind of like a more delicately. And uh, these things, I think we need to open mind to learn from them because we constantly improve ourselves. It's not because this is man or this is woman, right? We have to, ourselves need to believe we're equally capable of the other, the work other, uh, you know, the people do around us. I think Jane's point is really important. You are as smart, you are as capable, so be as capable, right? And don't allow any reason to think that you're not, because it's just not, I think, the truth. It's certainly not what I see every day. You know, on this topic, too, I, I really recommend a book called Compelling People. And Compelling People, it, it has all the social research 
on what makes a woman compelling and a man compelling. And there are some, some things that, for instance, uh, men can get away with table pounding and being emotional without losing their credibility. In fact, that's often seen as a sign of passion and strength. Uh, women, uh, women exert power through calm resolve by not caving in, but not being emotional either. And you can be passionate without being emotional. You can be forceful and strong without being emo emotional. And uh, what this book really talks about is all the social research. And it really says, some of you heard me speak say this, if you're clear on what your position is and you're calm, you can melt rock. So stand up for your thoughts. I'll just put it that way. Hi, uh, this is Anshma Singh, and it's wonderful listening to you all. Uh, my question to you both is, what was your strategy of choosing opportunities? And uh, did you ever have a vision of what exactly you would do, or did it just come along and build along? I would say it's kind of like a second, right? Um, especially at the beginning, if you, you want to move to the management ladder, and uh, it's important to you kind of like, uh, you know, finish or do your work well, so other people will recognize that. And then once you get to the certain level, like a senior director and above, at that point, you have an opportunity to choose which area you want to focus on, right? If at the beginning, you, you say, okay, before I move to the manager ladder, and I want to pick and choose which one will align with my future better, because just like, I don't, how many people here actually uh, practice Agile? Yeah, all, most of them, right? Uh, so it's the same, right? And you really don't know like 20 years from now, 10 years from now, what you will be. So you look at your short-term goal, and then once you get there, or if there's some, you know, uh, um, the zigzag and you need to adjust, it's the same concept, right? Um, so, um, that's why my, my advice, there's no, you know, um, pick and choose at the beginning, but once you reach to a certain point, you have a more experience, and then that will give you the opportunity to pick what you want. I would say um, I've started to see common themes for myself. Um, I like to build. I like to fix. Um, and I love people. People of all sorts and sizes, right? I... Um, when I was, and when you, when you're a salesperson, you learn to love all kinds of different people um, because you're selling to a lot of different types of customers. But I've liked people forever. I'm very social and extroverted and whatnot. Um, and so those, as I look, have looked through the themes, I like the opportunity that nobody else really wants or that somebody else doesn't see as an opportunity. Um, I like the opportunity to make a lasting effect to make a lasting change or to go build something from scratch or to redefine um, how we could do something as a company or a group. Um, and I love, um, you know, Will's point earlier about you need bosses who are supportive of you to go do these types of things. I've had exactly that incredibly supportive boss for the last couple of years who gave me a lot of leeway right, to go figure it out and, and had my back every time I came to him and said, I think I want to do this. You, is that good? And he go, yep, sounds great to me. Let's keep going, right? Um, and you have to be willing. People have taken risks on me. You have to be willing to take risks on other people. Um, and, you know, I've built a lot of people on my leadership team now who were in a role for a number of years, weren't sure their next path, but God, they're an exceptional marketer, right? Or they're an exceptional offer product manager. Um, and when you take a chance on somebody and you go, yeah, I think you could do the job, they come in and they give you 125% all day long. And that's, I think, the other thing is if you're going to build and you're going to fix, you got to have the people with you that believe in what you're trying to accomplish um, and know that you have their back as well. So for me, as long as I can continue to do those things, I think I'm going to get um, great opportunities because there's always something else to work on um, or that can be done you know, in a much better uh, manner. So hi, I have a question. Oh, over here. <laughs> 
Um, so my name is Renee Six. I am also an employee at Dell. Hi, Jane. Um, <laughs> so I'm in charge of our Women in Action program, which is our employee resource group um, where we bring in people for professional development for our women in tech organization. And one of the things that I've been asked um, quite frequently is, how have you selected a mentor? We've talked about um, leaders helping you in your career decisions, and I know that that's where I need help as well, is finding a mentor. And what are the characteristics that you have found have been helpful when you're looking for a mentor? I have to admit that uh, I really don't have an official mentor, but I do have a lot of role models around me. And, uh, and also I feel that, uh, you know, I learn a lot from the people, whether they report to me or I report to them, right? Uh, the, 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 the important thing is you have uh, uh, the network and the people that care about you, they're your sponsor. Whenever the opportunity comes, they will think about you, right? Um, the mentor, I'm not against mentor. It's important so that they can sh you always have a place to go to ask for opinion, right? But that requires, I will consider this one as a chemistry click, right? You cannot just go to, towards someone and say, okay, can you be my mentor? That won't work. I feel like the stay curious and always, um, you know, leverage the opportunity to learn different things. I feel I learn a lot from, you know, the, the people just around me, right? So um, we, I think in Dell, um, uh, every year we do have like a speed, um, the mentoring program for 30 minutes. Everyone sign up and we list of questions to the senior executive leader and then they help to answer the questions. I think this is very helpful, um, but uh, for the long kind of term engagement, I feel mentor, you know, Sometimes it works as long as you have a chemistry click, and uh, but uh, always you know think, see the role model around you so you can learn from them directly. Yeah, I think for me I've been through. We have formal mentoring programs, and you know you get assigned to somebody more senior, and um, I had really great experiences with us. I think I'm at a place now where I use coaches and sponsors much more. So a coach, um, I have tremendous peers who have been in the industry a lot longer than I have or much more technical than I am, I use those guys all the time around coaching, right? Help me understand why I should care about this, right? Um, and uh, I feel really blessed, actually, that my two closest peers that I deal with every day are much more, um, uh, have had much more industry experience, and they are amazing every day to me down to the, what I would consider probably a really stupid question, right, about an electrical system or whatever it is, and, and every time they're confident in helping me and thinking through it. Um, and then in big companies, sponsorship is incredibly important. Um, and I have, a, and I didn't really realize that until uh, a number of years ago when you realize you're not going to get your next great opportunity without sponsors. Very rarely, I think, do... Um, is the next great job found on the job board um, at a big an internal company. I think you have to build that network and figure out sponsorships and people have to really believe in you and, and what you're doing and, and take that next shot. So I'm sort of with Jane, I think of, I think for me today, it's more about coaching and sponsorships and um, going back to people I trust um, outside of anything to do with my everyday professional world, um, family and business school classmates and people like that who can, I think, can sometimes have that most honest conversation with you um, of, hey, maybe you're a little out of line or you need to think about this or whatever it may be, um, that, that somebody in the same company can't always have that conversation with you. Thank you. I have a question. Is it on? Oh, first of all, thank you. controlled. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, thank you so much for coming here and sharing your experiences with us. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, as uh, women in technology working in a male-dominant world, uh, what are the challenges that you encounter and how do you overcome them? And the second is, as you all know, the statistics shows that, you know, when you, um, 
there are a lot more women in the middle management. And when you get to you know, upper management, there are fewer and fewer of them. And what are the uh, unique traits and, and characteristics that you have um, that get you where you are today? Um, you know, for the, I will try the second question first, right? And I don't consider myself as unique. Um, but the thing is, in male-dominated industry, you have to be very determined to what you want, right? Um, that's one. Second one is you also need to have an ecosystem, and not only just from a work in the workplace and also the family, right? Because again, get to the work-life balance and the family support is extremely, extremely important. If for whatever reason you cannot get the support directly for, from your family members and seek some other help. If you have kids, small kids, just find some, you know, the, the, the daycare school or someone come to your home to uh, take care of baby, right? So it is, uh, it is extremely, you know, important for us to be determined to accomplish what others are doing. So that's... And also, kind of like, uh, think about, uh, you know, I was reading the article as well, you know, if you look at uh, in the middle layer and also in the engineering level, we have so many, it's kind of like 50% to 50%. But when it get to, down, get to the middle level, it's the number dropped. And uh, get to the top ones, it's even like uh, the, the percentage is so tiny, right? And my, I feel that, uh, you know, Right now, I feel the workplace itself was designed with a male in mind for a long, long time ago, right? So it's important for us to get uh, uh, the you know work closely with our male colleagues to make things happen, because only just depend on ourselves is not going to work. So we have to make sure that all the male executives are behind this mission to make sure that woman is equally uh, capable of uh, the leader, you know, the executive leadership role, and then a, a man, right, they're equal. Now, it get down to, well, what your, your, your first question is on the, sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the certain challenges, um, for example, you know, sometimes, especially in the sales uh, uh, field, right, you work with the, 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 the customer or some other uh, executives, you go to the bar and drink and things get done, or you go play golf and chat, chat and get a deal closed or, you know, position yourself for the better opportunity. And these kind of things, I don't think, uh, I, I'm not good at that, right? So um, I don't want to just uh, mimic what a male colleague does. Uh, what I, I the, the things I do is the you know make sure that my boss is happy. Right? This is very important because you do want your boss to sponsor you if there's any other opportunities, uh, you know, in the company. Uh, second one is to uh, demonstrate your capability across board, not just within your team, right? And the, the third one is when there's certain meetings uh, happen at the executive level, I notice that uh, a woman tends to sit uh, at other places because they don't feel like this is their meeting. And uh, probably there's only one person, you know, ch you know meeting organizer sitting in the, in the center of the table, and all the other seats around the table is open for you. Right. Don't try to be sure, oh, this is not my meeting, and I will sit at the corner. Always sit at the table, and uh, even like executive can see you directly even better. So get, and also get the support for, from other women um, in the team. Yeah, I think she answered it pretty well, so here's other question. I struggle with uh, trying to engender reciprocity with men in professional environment. And by that, I mean uh, helping men with their projects, my colleagues in the company up and down, going out of my way, just walking in and saying, I have something that can help you. Or people I know professionally, connecting them to positions, jobs in startups, making investor connections and all that. 
So you earn a lot of goodwill, but when your own turn comes to ask them to do something for them, the response is very poor. So one of the things, and I have talked to a lot of women, and they say, yeah, that happens a lot. So how do we get that reciprocity? And within men, it's not hard. They say, oh, yeah, you did this for me. I owe you one. Um, <clears throat> have you ever heard the phrase, there's a special place in hell for women that don't help other women? Yes. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think um, we have to help each other, right? No, I and didn't mean other women. I meant men. So the men gender divide, where women are expected to be helpful and nice and supportive. But I'm an equal professional, so when I'm supportive and helpful to them, all I get is maybe I become an influencer in the organization, and I become the person you need something you've got to talk to. But I also need things, and when I contact those people, it's not forthcoming, or it's very, very hard to get. So I think, um, one, boundaries, right? Yeah. You only work so well with the people who there is reciprocity over time. So I would encourage you to, to call people out sometimes if you're not getting what you need in the organization around, hey, I helped you with this. I need some help, right? Um, you know, for me, don't be shy. It, you have every reason to be there. You have every ability to be successful. Um, and, and not everybody is going to help you, and that's okay. Move on. Right? And find the people who are willing to work with you and engage with you um, and, and help. We don't, you know, it's a professional environment. Everybody isn't going to get along, and that's okay. Um, but, you know, for me, I think it's you really want to spend the time on people that are, are interested in helping you and can help you. Um, and there's, I don't know that there's a perfect answer to how to uh, make everybody work with you. I just don't think that's really realistic. We're, we're going to thank you very much. Um, we're going to wind this up now. Do you have one more question? Yes. Okay. Uh, just about that point about women. Um, uh, I see a lot that when I approach women for help, it's very difficult to get them to actually trust that they are in a position to help. Uh, so when we need to help people, um, we need to trust ourselves to say, okay, we have this power to help. Um, so when I am the one asking for help, how do I create that power in the other person, the person in front of me? Well, have you tried going down the path of saying, I know you did X, Y, and Z project, and that's exactly what I'm working on right now, so I know you have the experience to help me on this. Um, I think use real data points with them. Women like data as much as men, right? And they like to feel like their time um, is is useful and helpful. So to me, um, have your sort of argument points pretty clear about what it is you're trying to accomplish and why they can help you, rather than just, hey, you should help me because I'm a woman. And I, and that's not. I don't, I don't think any of us should really think about it. Look, they they can help you because there's a specific reason you're seeking them out. And another one is you may want to kind of like. A, put yourself in another person's shoe, right? If they help you out, what kind of you know, you know, benefit they will get? If you can relate, translate your ask to something can benefit both, it may help them to change their mind. Okay, uh, that's great, thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to say this about life. There, there are fundamentally two kinds of people. There are faucets and there's drains. The world is full of drains. Self-interested people will exploit you, promise you, and don't come through. And then there are faucets, and they're fulfilled by helping you. And they're not everywhere. You can't, just because of somebody's in a position to help you doesn't mean that they're a faucet. And so you have to use your own wisdom at the same time, I'd say this. You don't need that many faucets in your life to get what you want uh, in, in either your personal life or your, your professional life. But when you find a faucet, build a relationship. Help them as much as they're helping you. Create reciprocity with good people. And the few good people that you 
uh, find in your career and your life will make all the difference. I really want to thank our panelists today. And I want to thank you for all your good questions and your incredible attention. Thank you so much and enjoy the rest of the, the day.